How profitable is market gardening? That's the question we're answering today. Today, it's all about the money, money, money. Welcome to Modern Grower. I'm Diego, D-I-E-G-O. And for the past 11 years, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of farmers to talk about their farming journey. I've learned a lot along the way. And my goal is to share what I've learned with you to teach you about farming. So if you want to get into this business, you go in with a solid understanding of what you're getting into. I'm not going to teach you the nitty gritty techniques of how to farm. I'm just teaching you about farming and about the business of farming. If you want to learn more about the growing side, we have some other creators on this channel. My colleagues, Seth Davis and Chris Thoreau. They're going to talk all about growing microgreens for those of you that want to do that. But I'm focusing on the, the macro side, the business side of things. And I've learned a lot throughout the years, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So the answer to this question, which is going to be a question I'll answer over two parts, but the short answer is market gardening can be incredibly profitable. That's the TLDR. Market gardening it is or can be very profitable. There's no doubt about it. I've talked to enough farmers to know that this is a fact. But that doesn't mean that every farm will be profitable. Because we know at the end of the day, it all comes down to the operator who's running the farm. Good operators will make money. Bad operators will lose money. It doesn't matter if you have a nail shop, a coffee shop, a Taco Bell, or a muffler shop. People who run their businesses efficiently make money. People who aren't on top of their businesses will lose money. What does that mean? You have to control costs. You have to have a growing customer base, you have to price your product appropriately, and you have to control or know your numbers. If you can't do those things, you're not going to make money. It's not about growing crops to be a profitable market farm. There's one part of farming that's growing crops. The rest of it is running a farm business. So let's separate those two out right now. I don't care if you want to start a farm to grow stuff. Garden. If you want to get into farming, you better be coming in to learn how to run a business. And you better know how to run a business. That's what this video is going to be about. How do you profitably run a market farm? And we're going to talk about what goes into making farms profitable. Because they absolutely are if they're run by the right person. What are the key factors that affect profitability? Crop selection, cultivation techniques, which include things like crop management or crop planning, succession planning, direct marketing, controlling your labor and overhead, being in the right market, and pricing. Those are the keys. If you can do those things well, then you will make money. So let's start off with crop selection. Typically, market farms are constrained by the amount of land that they have. They don't have a lot. So knowing that, you have to grow the most profitable crops that you can on that given land base. Should be obvious, right? You only have a little bit of land. If I grow stuff that's low value, then my sales are low. If I grow stuff that's high value, then my sales are high. We're just looking at those things in a vacuum. High value crops are things like carrots, salad mix, microgreens, tomatoes, root vegetables. Low value crops are things like potatoes, corn, melons, green beans could be in that category, squash. Things that typically take longer to grow and don't produce as much yield 
per given square foot. When you don't have a lot of land, it's maximizing that dollar per square foot that's really important. So when we think about crops, it's what could this crop generate per given linear foot of bed? Or per, per given day in the bed is another metric we can look at in a future video. Techniques of how you manage the crops also will affect your profitability. Why? Because we're trying to get the most value out of our farm as we can. We're trying to sell the most stuff for the highest possible price while keeping our costs down. That means profits. So we could just say, we'll just lower costs. That's fine. But how do we get the top end up? How do we boost sales? As we previously talked, sell high value crops. Now let's say, how do we sell the most high value crops that we can? Because it's one thing to say we'll sell 100 units of high-value crops. But over the course of a season, what if we could sell 500 units of those high-value crops? Now we're making even more money, which helps cover costs and overhead. So these intensive cultivation techniques are things like succession planting, Things like planting on high, high density, succession planting. What is that? It means I plant something in one bed, then I come back later once I harvest that and I plant something right after it. And then I plant something right after that. So I'm never letting that land sit idle. I'm always keeping something productive planted in it. This would be the equivalent of if you had a CNC machine and you had to invest a lot of money in that machine. Ideally, you want that machine running 24-7 as much as you possibly can. It was a big investment to get it. Let's make sure we're running it all the time. A hotel costs a lot of money to build. You want those rooms occupied as much as possible. A restaurant, expensive to set up. You want that restaurant as full as possible, as much as you can. And when people leave after eating one meal, you want another group to come in. That's how restaurants make money. They turn tables. A couple comes in, they eat, leave. Another couple sits at that table. They eat, they leave. Another couple comes in and sits at that table. That one table has generated three checks at the end of the night. Well, your beds on your farm, you want to think of them the same way. How many crops can you get out of a given bed in a given growing season? If you can get more crops out of a given bed, then you're effectively adding more land. Here's the scenario. I plant a crop. I harvest it. That bed sits idle for three weeks. And then finally I decide to plant something else into it. Will those three weeks cost me? If I did that a couple times over the season, it's three weeks plus three weeks plus another three weeks. Let's say we get up to nine weeks. If we had planted during those nine weeks, we could get a whole nother crop in. That's a whole nother crop's worth of product that we could sell and make money from. So successions really matter in terms of profitability on a farm. Planting density. A lot of gardeners plant on wide spacings, one foot spacings. That leaves a lot of open space in between each row. If you could just plant in, in that open space, you're adding yield to your given area. The more yield, the more you can sell. What we're trying to do by selecting the right crops, by selecting intensive cultivation techniques, 
is get the most possible value out of a given land base that we can. High value crops raises the value of what we're selling. Planting more raises the value of what we're doing. When we do this, we take land that's this big, and if we can get more successions out of that land per year, we've effectively added more land. If we increase the density of crops on a given bed, we've effectively added more land without actually adding more land. Season extension is another technique. At Modern Grower, my company, we sell a lot of season extension products to help growers get their crops deeper into the fall and earlier into the spring. Why? If you have a growing season that's 30 weeks long, you can grow Y units of product. Well, if we can take that 30 weeks and make it now 36 weeks, you can have Y plus some incremental unit of product to sell. More product to sell means more money in your pocket. That increases the farm's profitability. Why else might you want to season extend? Well, people who season extend have advantages at markets. They might be the only person selling at that market. So they can command a higher price. Everybody buys from them if they're the only ones that have that product. If you have a loyal customer base, by servicing them throughout more of the year, you keep them a little bit closer So they're not going off to grocery stores and stuff when you shut down. It's like if I can keep providing them profit, a product that helps your profits. This is really the key to market farming. If we stopped the video here, this is what I want anybody who's thinking about getting into this to take away. You're limited on the land you can grow. You need to find a way to grow the highest value crops on that limited amount of land that you can. You can increase crop value by choosing a higher value crop. That's one way. So that's one dial you can turn and go from a low value crop to a high value crop. Another way is you can grow more of that crop on a given bed by increasing density, increasing your soil fertility, things like that, more fertility, better plant growth, better production. So if you can increase the production on a given bed, that's a way to add value. Another dial that you have to play with are your successions. If I can get more successions per year on a given crop, I have more of that crop to sell. So at the end of the year, when I total it up on a spreadsheet, I've made more money. That's obvious. So those are the things you can do on your farm to start to control labor, to get the most out of the land base that you have. But we all know in order to make a profit, which is sales minus expenses, that's profit. You have to have sales, right? So if you can't sell any of this stuff, there's no point. But that doesn't matter. We can sell tires or chalk or computers. If I can't sell it, I'm not making money. That's obvious. When market farmers sell, they need to go the highest value route of customers that they can. Just like you want to grow high value crops, you want to sell it to high value customers. You want to go direct to consumer. Because the will pay the highest price. If you sell to a wholesaler, they can take more volume, which you probably can't produce at this scale. And they're going to need a much lower price because they're going to sell it to somebody who's going to sell it to somebody else. And everybody wants to mark it up. So the only way they can mark it up is you have to mark it down. So that's why you go direct to consumer and really get those higher prices. You can go to chefs, and by forming good relationships with chefs, that will help. 
You can work with local grocery stores that often want to support local businesses to take surplus because this is another key. You, you also want to make sure you're selling everything you grow. I have a book by the name of that on Amazon, by the way. I'll link to that below. Because there's no point in growing it if you can't sell it. So having these multiple market streams is often key. Ideally, I want to sell as much as I can to the highest value market stream, direct to consumer, farmer's market, CSAs, online stores, farm stands, that type of thing, because that gets me the highest margin. So I'm going to funnel as much product as I can through that channel. Maybe they take it all. Maybe they can't. What they can't take, I do want to sell that even at a lower margin. I still want to make profit. I have to be profitable on every sale but I can take a lower margin on the extra stuff. That's where these relationships with local grocery stores, chefs, things like that come in. So ideally, you end each week flat. You produce this much, you sold this much, nothing left at the end of the day. Now, the other part of a profit equation is the costs. Costs on farms aren't that high. Most farms, your biggest cost by far is labor. Everything else is relatively cheap compared to labor. We're not talking about infrastructure expenses here. Buying high tunnels, buying a tractor, those types of things. Those are capital investments. We're talking about expenses of producing a given product. When you produce a product on a farm, you have the seed cost. You have the labor cost to do everything from the seeding to the weeding to the harvesting to the selling. And you have some amendment costs in the bed. Those are your kind of three categories, right? There might be some water costs, some utilities, all that insurance, like That's kind of another general category. Fairly low when you spread it out on a bed-by-bed basis. But of those three seed labor amendments, this one, the one that's the nasty finger, is the one that's going to be the highest cost. So control your labor, control your expenses. If you have high labor costs, your profits will be lower. If you have High labor costs, you'll have high expenses. Now, there are things like infrastructure, startup costs, all that, which that's the cost of investing into the business. I don't think that really goes down to a bed-by-bed business, and that can be paid off over time. And I think the cost of starting a farm is relatively low compared to starting a Applebee's franchise or something like that. So they're there but you're not feeling the effects of that on a day-to-day basis. Control your spending, keep your labor low, and your cost should be relatively low. So if we think about our example, we grew all the salad mix. Why not just plant a whole farm of salad mix? Then We can 50 beds, let's grow 50 beds worth of salad mix, and we're cooking. We're making money here. We're literally growing green. Well, it comes down to market demand. How much can you actually sell? If you can sell it all, grow it all. That's any business. If you have a high profit product, you produce absolutely as much as you possibly can of that product, as much as the market will take, not more. If you overproduce, you're creating waste. So just because it's profitable doesn't mean that's all you grow. You have to consider the cost or sorry, you have to consider the market demand. It can only absorb so much and you want to push as much into it as you can for every given product. Ideally at the direct-to-consumer route. So in our lettuce example, we want to sell all of it direct-to-consumer and as much as we can. But what we can't, we're going to have to take a lower price to go to chefs and all that just to move what we're growing. So market demand 
is important. You also have to grow crops that people want to pay a premium price for. I've heard farmers say in some markets, like, my market doesn't value salad mix. I can't sell it. Then you don't grow it. A lot of farmers, I'm shocked. Like, I don't get this at all. I'm not from the South, although I did go to school there. Virginia Tech. Okra, a huge crop for a lot of farmers. I, I don't get it. It's slimy. It's weird. But certain markets and certain farms crush it selling okra. That wouldn't work in California. That wouldn't work in New York where I grew up. People aren't buying it. So there are these regional things. You need people to pay a premium price. You need to pay a premium price for volume. You want a lot of people to buy it. So two customers who want to buy your premium okra isn't worth doing. But if you have 50 customers who want to buy your premium okra, that's worth doing. Do that all day. Not every crop will be a premium product. We're going to have to add some diversity to the mix just to keep people coming. You can't necessarily just have a mix of salad. Or sorry, you can't just have a farmer's market booth of salad. People are probably going to want to buy other things. They can only take so much salad a week, so you want to give them more stuff. I buy some salad, I buy some tomatoes, I buy some carrots, which I can all mix up into my salad. Now I've sold them three things instead of just one thing. Now, all these other crops might not have the same value profile, the high profit profile that the salad mix does, but as long as you're making money, you're going to want to grow them. So you want to add some diversity to the mix. Very important. When you're selling, the other big key is proper pricing. And this is kind of a scary thing. I've written about this a lot in my newsletter, Seeding Thoughts. A lot of people do not know their costs. I've talked to farmers about this. It's a big problem. If you watch a lot of makeover type shows where they make over a business, this is why a lot of these businesses fail. Robert Irvine, Gordon Ramsay, somebody like that goes and helps a business. Some of these business owners have no clue what their costs are. There's a lot of farmers who have no clue what their costs are. If you don't know how much it costs to make this lens in your Sony, how do you know how much to sell it for? You're just guessing. You might produce, sell it for really high and make a bunch of money. You might sell it too low and you're losing money. So you have to, have to, have to know your costs of which labor is one of the biggest ones. If you only tracked labor, you'd be better off than tracking nothing. That's kind of a pass I'm giving you. If you're like, oh, uh, I don't want to track costs, Diego. It's too much work. Track your seed costs. Track your labor costs. Track your amendment costs. If you pay for water, Track that cost. That'll give you a rough price per bed. You need to know per bed of Salanova. What am I into that for? Am I into it for 20 bucks or am I into it for 220? That's a huge difference. And not knowing is not a good enough answer because then when you go to price that product, let's say you price that whole bed at $300. How do you know if you're making money or $150? A chef comes to you and I buy the whole bed's worth. Okay, I'll sell it to you for $150. Did you make money? I don't know. Why not? It's your job to know. Shame on you for not knowing. So know your costs. Like You will probably not be profitable. You will fail as a market gardener or in any business if you don't know your costs. For my business, we sell a lot of fabric, we sell seeds, we sell tools. Before I bring anything on board and start to sell it, I run through spreadsheets to figure out how much is it going to cost us to sell this and get it to the customer and what can I sell it for based on that? And is the profit margin that I can make worth the investment? That's the exercise you need to do. So first you need to figure out your cost, then you determine what do I sell it for? You kind of need to be around the market. If your market on okra and you're selling little pints of okra is $3 a pint, 
you probably can't sell it for nine. Like, I'm sorry to tell you, your okra's not three times better. Can you maybe get away with five? Probably. Can you get away with eight? No. Do you want to be selling it at two? No, you don't want to undercut. Like then it's just a race to the bottom in a price war. Nobody's going to win in that. But you want to price it relative to the market. How good is your product? Are you organic? Are there other things that can push you to the, the higher side? As a market farm, you definitely want to be operating on the, if this is average, this is kind of the below average product and this is the above average you're like in this band you're on the premium side of product you don't have to go the whole foods route and be like that high end but you cannot be the bargain basement walmart produce like you're not going to compete there it doesn't work at this scale you just simply can't grow enough to compete you need to be on the higher end of pricing so you price based on where is the market, where is your cost, and then you look at that profit margin and say, is this enough? You throw it out there and then see how the market responds. If they sell out instantly, you might have priced too low. If you sell none, you might have a bad crop, you might be your marketing, you might be priced too high. So you adjust from there. Your, your pricing will convey the product itself, if you're like the cheapest person for tomatoes at the market, that might say something. I mean, we've all done this. You look at restaurants, clothing brands, whatever. I don't care. You all have something, food at the store. You see a generic brand and you know it's cheaper and you think it's less quality than a premium brand because it's price different. They've done studies with wine on this and people think it. Higher price does does create the picture in a mind of a more premium product in a lot of customers. This is not to say to extort customers. I'm just saying you need to be at the premium side when you sell to customers. Unit size is really important. If you sell cherry tomatoes, how big is the unit? It's not a one. You're selling a bunch of them. How many? If you're selling a bunch of carrots, a bunch of beets, how big is the bunch size? If you had six carrots in a bunch and you had 12 carrots in a bunch, well, you're getting twice as many bunches. If you do the six size than the 12, that's more to sell. So optimizing that. How do you figure all this stuff out? Go visit farmer's markets, go to local grocery stores, talk to other farmers. The farm community is amazing and loves to share. I'm sure there's farmers online that are willing to give you some help along the way. And you can chat up farmers at farmer's markets. What does it cost you to produce this? That type of thing. They might not know, but you know you should know now. So you can get cost. You're going to have to do research. I hear stories about people who say you can't make money market farming, and I'm not sure they're doing any of this stuff. It isn't just show up and grow. Yes, growing is like viewed as this fundamental human thing that we should all be able to grow and grow food. It's a human right. Yeah, but to sell it isn't. It's a privilege to have your own business. And it takes dedication, hard work in the field and in the office to make a business succeed. Just because you grow doesn't mean you're going to have a profitable business. So I've interviewed farmers who really struggle. And a lot of it is they don't have the demand. They're maybe not growing the right crops. They're definitely not as business savvy as some of the other farmers that are doing really, really well. So the, in this video... We talk about this idea of, is it profitable? With a broad brush, it absolutely is profitable. Look at that Salanova example, the Salon Mix example. Selling a product for up here. Costs are down here. We made all this money. Does that mean everyone who grows it will make money? No. Because they'll get the business part wrong. From costing to pricing to selling. You have to do all of this to make a profit. 
Okay, Just because you market farm doesn't mean you'll be profitable. You have to do many things while operating said market farm to be profitable. Knowing that, how much could you make? Revenue per acre, all over the board. $2,000 to $400,000 per acre is a range. That's an insane range. I get it. But I've talked to farmers who are doing these types of numbers. That's revenue. There, how much profit can they make? 30 to 60%. Okay? That's what I think the profit margin can be on market farms. Between 30 and 60%. Somewhere in there. You sell $100,000 worth of stuff, you made 30 grand. Maybe you made 60 grand. Somewhere in there, depending on your market, your costs, all that type of thing. But it can be a lot of money in some markets. And for people that dispute that, there are farmers in every state that are, I'm sure are doing that well. I've talked to dozens of farmers making money in the hundreds of thousand dollars per acre range. It is doable. And this isn't money they're making from YouTube and other things like that, teaching courses. This is on-farm revenue. It's possible. Does it mean everyone can do it? No. Just like everyone can't be in the Olympics. Everyone can't have a successful taco shop, whatever, microbrew. But there are people who run taco shops and microbrew. They crush it. Maybe you can be one of those people too. Income potential, you know, this varies at 5000 to 150000 per season per acre. There's money to be made here. You can earn a living wage. You can earn a living wage plus. Not everyone will. It's not going to be easy. It's not guaranteed, but it's possible. So don't dismiss it and also don't think that this is easy. To wrap this all up, market gardening works with the right planning, with the right practices, with the right mindset, and taking time to build a business can reap very profitable rewards because time is the other key. Don't expect this week one, month one, market one, maybe even year one. But by year five, you could be crushing it on your market farm. If you focus on high-value crops, direct-to-consumer sales, efficient growing techniques, high-density crop rotations, that type of thing, and keep your labor costs down, you can make a living doing this. That's, I think, one reason I keep doing the podcast, why I wanted to make these YouTube videos, because there's a lot of naysayers who say you can't. And they're usually people that tried and failed. But know that it's possible. Know that there are people doing it, and you can be one of the people doing it too. But you're going to have to put in the work, watch your numbers, and give it some time. If you have any comments, questions, thoughts on this video, leave them below and I'll check them out and try and include them in the video. This is part one of a two-part series answering that question, how profitable is market gardening? I hope it gave you a good overview. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.